Welcome back, everyone, to the industry's first conference focused exclusively on safety topics in sterile processing departments. I am so excited to, uh, to um, introduce our next speaker. Marianne Drosnak is the Director of Clinical Affairs at Healthmark Industries, where she provides expertise on medical device processing and leads a team of clinical educators, a fantastic team of educators. Uh, she's the co-chair of Amy Working Group 84, which writes ST91 and and TIR 99. Um, Marianne is going to talk about the steps that should be built into endoscope processing to engineer safety. The theme of today's conference is safety. These steps are already recommended or required in the national standards and professional society guidelines, but facilities are often not aware of them. So I am pleased to introduce to you and to welcome Marianne Drosnak. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and welcome everyone to the program today. I hope you do enjoy it. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. As you heard, my name is Marianne Drosnock, and I'm the Director of Clinical Affairs at Healthmark Industries and co-chair of Amy ST91, which also res uh, is responsible for writing the new TIR99, which is not quite ready for everybody yet, but that'll be on probes and dilators. So just a hint of what's to come. Let's go ahead and get started. So as disclosure, as you've heard, I am an employee of Healthmark Industries, a company located in Michigan that's responsible for the manufacturing and distribution of medical products, mainly used in sterile processing or endoscopy um, and infection prevention. And I've received no compensation for this. And of course, all opinions presented are those of myself. So I do hope you enjoy it. And I'll always refer you back to the IFU for the products that we're talking about. So we always include this slide in our presentations, and I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that Healthmark has a policy and philosophy that are centered around education and making sure that our professionals in endoscopy, in sterile processing, in infection prevention are knowledgeable and have the most up-to-date, highest quality information that we can give related to proper processing of medical devices, not just our products, but really to make sure that you have a great educational base on what the standards, guidelines, best practices tell you as far as um, processing those devices to make it safe for our next process or our next procedure that uses that device. So I think it's important to know that um, education really does um, have a, such a, a base in our industry and making sure that you know the background as to why these devices have to be cleaned and have to be disinfected or sterilized process and making sure you're aware of those evidence-based guidelines to build up what are the best practices for your facilities. So what are our objectives for today? Before we get into the nitty gritty of the presentation, we're gonna talk about some safety quality assurance parameters that should already be built into endoscope processing based on the current standards and guidelines, as Lindsay said. And we wanna make sure that all of these are engineered in upfront so that we have the best safe outcome that we can for our patients. And we're going to look at what those best practices are in some steps along the way, talk about cleaning verification, surveillance testing, things like culturing of endoscopes to help prevent hospital acquired infections related to these devices and, and even surgical site infections and help to make sure those uh, devices are patient ready. Okay, so first poll question, who is joining us today? So please click on your screen for what your answer is. I'll give you just a second more here to answer. Let me know where you're joining us from, what area of the healthcare facility. All right, let's wind that down and see where we're at. All right, 75% sterile processing technicians, welcome, great. Um, and 25% vendor or manufacturer. So we do welcome everyone here today and let's get started talking about ways to engineer safety into your endoscope uh, reprocessing procedure. You can only say processing so many times, so there I'll have to make it reprocessing. So let's lead off um, with some 
more recent recommendations or guidelines that are out there from some of the different groups. This one starting with is from the FDA. And this came out to us last summer in 2019, which seems like a world away from where we are today, but really not that long ago. And we saw the safety alert from the FDA, which recommends that hospitals and endoscopy facilities transition away from our traditional duodenoscopes that have that fixed end cap to those with newer designs that can facilitate or even eliminate totally uh, reprocessing of that device. So things like, do they have a disposable end cap on them, a disposable tip, or is the whole scope or the channel disposable? We really need to be thinking about transitioning to newer models that facilitate that reprocessing and safe reprocessing of the medical device. We do need to ensure, as always, that our staff are following the IFU, the reprocessing instructions for these duodenoscopes and, of course, all devices. Uh, but what we have found through post-market safety surveillance programs that are, are posted on the FDA website, that generally... Um, after after a, a culturing in the field of clinical scope from the different scope manufacturers across different models of duodenoscopes, that it's there's about five percent of the time where they culture positive for high concern organisms, even after we follow the steps of proper processing. So being observed in a healthcare facility by the scope manufacturer with everything being done properly. We still get 5% of the time um, when we can culture high concern organisms like E. coli or Pseudomonas, those that have been linked to uh, causing infections with these scopes in the past. So very much a concern to me as an infection preventionist to see that even when things are done right, we're still having issues. Human factors also plays into the proper processing of these devices. And there have been studies in the field also uh, related to the human factors for duodenoscope processing. And for some duodenoscopes, um, what was shown during these post-market safety surveillance was that about nine out of 12 uh, pre-cleaning tasks were not successfully performed, meaning that um, for, as an example, 40% of the time participants failed to raise and lower the forceps elevator three times, as the IFU says, or 27% participants failed to release the air water ch channel cleaning adapter button to flush air for 10 seconds. And what's published in this guidance from the FDA is that of the 73 what are deemed critical manual cleaning steps, 45 were not performed successfully by the technician doing the processing, 27% or more of the participants. So 45 were not successfully performed by 27% or more of the participants. So a critical number of steps not being performed correctly or not being performed at all. So we know that we need to do better and that there is not good adherence um, to the IFU, to the steps that are written in the IFU. And that's a lot of what we'll focus on today is making sure that we do follow the steps that are outlined because that's what's validated and tested by the scope manufacturer, those steps that are in the IFU to prove um, that that scope can be adequately processed. And then that is what is sent to you as part of your IFU, your instructions. So anytime you deviate from those instructions, you're not sure what the outcome will be and if you actually get a cleaned and disinfected or sterilized scope at the end. Other recommendations that came out of that FDA safety alert that are important are that you, as of at the facility level, should institute a quality control program. And what does that mean? That means you should be culturing and sampling your duodenoscopes or, and using other monitoring methods. You also want to make sure that you're considering instituting some of those supplemental measures that the FDA had released earlier, such as sterilizing your scopes, uh, again, this was particular to duodenoscopes or using a liquid chemical sterilant processing system as long as it's approved for use with and cleared um, as part of that device's labeling. You also want to monitor your processing procedures, and you do that through something like sampling and culturing. And there is a link there on your screen to the, duos the FDA CDC ASM culture method for how to sample and culture your duodenoscopes 
if that's something your facility decides to do. You also want to make sure you're adhering to the routine inspection intervals that are now uh, recommended and, and part of the scheduling from your scope manufacturer and doing that periodic maintenance and inspection according to the Duodena Scope manufacturer's instructions for use. So all important steps in the process and ways that you can engineer quality and safety into your Duodena Scope processes. You can always culture more scopes. You can culture bronchoscopes, you can culture your reader-scopes, whatever it is that you want. But you really need to be considering, what am I doing for my duodena scopes? There was also a statement that led to a lot of confusion in the FDA statement about ATP and its potential for monitoring reprocessing effectiveness. And if you really drill down to what it says, it says that um, there was some issues with uh, with facilities and manufacturers using ATP um, to indicate the presence of live microbes. And we have to remember that ATP or protein, hemoglobin, whatever it is that you're using, those are cleaning verification tests. They're not meant to mo monitor the state or quality of an endoscope after it's completely done with processing. They are meant to assess the state of the endoscope after cleaning verification and demonstrate that there are not this indicator of patient debris. So we can't market devices or we can't market cleaning verification tests for after use in the uh, in the process, after the disinfection process, and therefore you at the facility level should not be using those cleaning verification tests to assess the status of the endoscope after disinfection. They should be used after manual cleaning and prior to disinfection or prior to sterilization. So I believe that's where the confusion lies in the marketing of those products and also the interpretation at the hospital level is to how those devices should be used. Now, I don't want to focus solely on duodenoscopes. There are many different types of endoscopes that are processed in many different areas in healthcare facilities. And we, as we know, uh, flexible endoscopes are widely used in a variety of different clinical settings. So let's just take a minute to realize all the different places that in the healthcare facility where endoscopes may be used and processed. And if you really are, are drilling down to a quality management system, you should be identifying in your healthcare system where all of these dis different scopes are located, where they're used, and where they're being processed. It's a huge safety step to know and have control over all of those devices. Even if you don't centralize them at your facility, but you at least know, okay, this, um, this outpatient setting has some ENT scopes or this urology office does these kinds of scopes, but they're all, with under the, uh, all within the arm of your healthcare facility, you should know that. So GI scopes we see commonly processed and used in the GI endoscopy suite, but they may also be sent to sterile processing. In, and sometimes we'll see the surgical scopes will go there into sterile SPD, but not the, uh, not the GI scopes. It's really, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever works best for your facility. We do see a trend towards centralization, uh, meaning that all scopes would go to sterile processing. But we also see in a lot of facilities that sterile processing now is in charge of uh, processing endoscopes, but that it's still done in the endoscopy suite per se. But they will staff the endoscope processing area with sterile processing technicians. That's okay too. As I said, as long as you have control over the situation that you have your, your dedicated technicians who are knowledgeable, trained, and competent in processing endoscopes, then whatever works right for your facility and your system is what you should be doing. But we do need to think about, as the standards say, um, not, not centralizing necessarily if that doesn't work for you, but standardizing is the key and making sure that what, whatever we're doing in one setting is the same across the different settings within your healthcare facility or within your system. So making sure that if we're processing something one way in an office setting, that we're doing the same in a surgery center versus the same in your SPD at the main hospital, that's what's important is to have that control over the situation and the setting. Then we have our OR scopes. Those are usually processed in central sterile, but could be sent to GI and again, depending on your facility. 
bronchoscopes, those might be done in respiratory or GI endo or sterile processing. Again, it varies. What about those that are done in your ambulatory surgery centers or endoscopy centers that are still affiliated with your health healthcare system? Are those processed on site or sent to the main hospital or even to endoscopy? It varies. And physicians' offices, we often see those processed on site and not necessarily done correctly. So please keep that in mind when you're evaluating all the different areas within your system where scopes are being reprocessed, or they could be sent to the main hospital to SPD or endo. Again, all of them should be processed to the same standard of care across the different sites. That's what ST91 says. So within a given institution, endoscopy, sterile processing, ambulatory care, everyone should be in sync together. That's how we get to safety for our patients when it comes to standardizing our practices and making sure we're aligned on what overarching standard or guideline it is that we're following for how to reprocess endoscopes. It may be ST91, or you may say you're following AORN or SGNA so that you know and are standard across the different sites. So what is expected for the cleaning and disinfection or sterilization practices? What do we base those on? Oh, and it looks like there might be an automatic timing in there. I apologize for that. As we know, um, we always have to rely on the manufacturer's instructions for use, also known as the IFU or the MIFU or even the DFU, depending on where you're located in the world. Um, and we also um, base that on national standards and guidelines and best practices, and, and then we implement all of that into our institutional policies so that we have one procedure that we know exactly what to do, and it's based on the IFU and the industry guidelines. I'm not sure what's happening here with, uh, with these slides. They're kind of going out of control. So the IFU, those are our key expectations. That's what's validated by the manufacturer uh, for the devices being processed. Now, what is all of that based on? We have the difference in tiers, our regulations, our standards, and our professional society guidelines, and we have to look at all of that. At the top of that tier are our regulations, and those are rules or directives made by governmental authorities, government agencies like OSHA. So those are things that we have to follow. They are mandatory. So that governs something in endoscopy like contaminated transport of medical devices and sharp instruments. And OSHA there says that we need to make sure that they are contained in a, um, in a solid container that's marked biohazardous that has leak-proof sides and bottoms. All of that is governed by OSHA regulations. Again, we have to follow that. Our next tier down then are our standards. And these are national standards such as from Amy or ANSI. And these are requirements to, and specifications to ensure consistency and fit for purpose across a variety of instrumentations. And that, for example, is ST91, the national standard for flexible and semi-rigid endoscope processing for the US. And although the adoption of those standards are considered voluntary, they can become mandatory. And how that happens is if your facility says that they comply with AMI standards like ST91 or ST79, then you are held to those when you're surveyed and inspected. And then it becomes mandatory that you follow it that way. There are also certain states where AMI standards are mandatory, such as New Jersey, where you would be expected to follow that standard. And then also your healthcare system may adopt AMI standards as, um, as their guiding document. So then if, therefore you would follow that. Below that then we have the next tier down, which are your guidelines and recommended practices, such as technical information reports from AMI standards, professional society guidelines like SGNA or AORN. All of these give you technical guidance and information. Oftentimes they're more general on a given topic, um, or they may even be just specific to a certain type of device like GI endoscopes for SGNA. But then what do you do with your bronchoscope? and your ureteroscopes, and that's where ST91 plays into the, the fact that it is 
the overarching do document that covers all types of flexible endoscopes in any setting. So it really can be used to cover all of your endoscopes. These are considered voluntary, your professional society guidelines and recommended practices, but with interpretation, meaning again, that if you say you comply with SGNA guidelines, as an example, uh, in your facility, then you are held to that when you're being surveyed by something like the Joint Commission or AAA HC. Okay. So for endoscope processing, what are those standards and guidelines based on? Well, in principle, all of them are based on quality improvement, quality assurance, and monitoring your processes. Historically, we haven't had a lot of good um, monitoring built into disinfection. Uh, we had our test strip to show whether our disinfectant was above the MRC, the minimum required concentration, or the MEC, the minimum effective concentration. But what else did we have before we didn't? So what we're talking about today is other ways that we can engineer in safety and quality and monitor that process to have a good, safe output for our patient. All of those standards and guidelines are based on clinically relevant and evidence-based practices and studies, all of which are, are coming more and more frequently we're seeing these studies released in peer review literature and other articles like trade journals, non-peer reviewed literature and other research. Of course, we take into account the manufacturer's IFUs and what they're recommending when we're writing standards and guidelines. And because of those changes and the fluctuations and all the studies that are being done, it's a dynamic process that leads us to documents having to be updated periodically. Uh, we would love them to be the most up-to-date they can be, but it is quite a process to get something like a national standard updated, and it does take several years. And we'll talk about that in just a slide or two because we do have a new document coming soon for ST91. Other resources that you want to be aware of when you're looking at what are the best practices or policies to guide your endoscope processing um, policies internally at your facility. These are some other ones that you want to keep in mind. We have some good guidance from HICPAC called, called the Essential Elements for Reprocessing of Endoscopes available on their webpage. And it's a whole slew of different documents in there, like a gap analysis, audit tools, you name it, they're in there to help you develop your policies and practices at your facility for endoscope processing. You want to make sure you're following and get the latest information from those FDA safety communications. You can sign up on the FDA to get an email when anything new is released. If not, then you look at your news outlets and, and periodically at the website to make sure uh, that you're up to date on the most current FDA safety communications related to scopes or any other device. And then we always need to consult our manufacturer's IFUs for endoscopes. They can change periodically. So you need to make sure that you have the most up-to-date version of that IFU um, for the scopes, your automated processing equipment like your AERs, and any accessories that are used. All, another document that you should keep in, keep in mind um, when it comes to benchmarking quality practices you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's already great guidelines out there for you to follow. And Amy ST90 is one of them, which talks about quality management systems for device processing areas. It's not specific to endoscope. It's used for instituting a quality management system or QMS anywhere that medical devices are processed. And it specifies the minimum, re minimum requirements that a healthcare facility should put in place as part of that quality management system. Um, it was developed by a combination of healthcare professionals uh, through the AMI Standards Board to make sure that devices are effectively, efficiently, and consistently processed properly in order to prevent infections related to reuse of that devices. And, and instituting a quality management system is another way to engineer safety into your endoscope processing practices. All right, which leads me to my favorite topic, and that's Amy ST91. As you know, I, I do co-chair that group, and I've been doing it for a number of years. And we 
are currently working on the next version, hopefully either later this year, late 2020 or early 2021, we will have a new document available for you. So it will be ST91 2020 or 2021 um, when that's released. So I'm very excited. It has a lot of great updates and a lot more information for you as to what are the requirements and what are the recommendations related to endoscope processing. The current version is still um, of twenty of ST91 is from 2015. So we want to make sure we have at least the 2015 version, and then we'll move toward uh, this new version coming out later this year. It has been approved, so that's good news. Um, it has been approved by the committee and is just in the technical editing portion of it. So once it's adopted by the Amy Standards Board um, and goes to ANSI for final approval and it goes out for its 15-day review period, then we'll have that ST91 um, released to the public. Um, at first, it'll be published electronically is how it normally works. And then we will see it in a, um, in a, a print version, if that's what you're interested in doing. <clears throat> Okay, let's move on to some best practices and ways that you can engineer safety into your process that we haven't already talked about. Of course, all the steps in the process are, are important, but we have to make sure we do a great job with cleaning um, in order to facilitate the, the entire process and make sure we end up with a safe scope for our next patient. With that, we have our next poll question. So please tell me what you follow in your facility for an endoscopy standard or guideline related to processing of medical devices. Do you follow ST91 from Amy, AORN endoscopy processing guidelines, SGNA processing guidelines, CDC, or another? So if you could just take a second and let me know. All right. Please, if you, you may not see the submit, submit button on your screen, you might have to scroll down to get to the submit button. So make sure you do that. Click on which document you're following and then scroll to get to that submit button. Let's see where we're at. Thank you all for doing that. So we see most often of the attendees today, 70% of the time we're following Amy ST91. 3.3% AORN, 20% SGNA, and 6.7% other. Feel free to type in the chat or the Q&A for me um, what other document it is you're following or if you have any questions related to any of those. If we don't get time for questions, everybody's questions today, I will get a copy of them and I'll make sure that I follow up with every question that you have. It just We won't have time for everything today. Thank you. Okay, let's start with what was called pre-cleaning, and that's a little uh, sneak peek of what's to come. Uh, pre-cleaning in the next ST91 will be re-termed point-of-use treatment, and that aligns with where the newer standards like ST79 and the other guidelines are going because we don't want to allude to or make it seem like Pre-cleaning is really has to be full cleaning in the procedure room. You should never be using a brush there or anything like that. So we want to make sure that it's clear that we mean a treatment, a post-procedure treatment, in order to prevent the biofilm <clears throat> and bio burden from building up and also to wet the channels of the scope and do a do a just a gross soil removal of it, really. Um, so pre-cleaning, I'm going to refer to it still because that's how the IFUs will, will say. It'll take a while for them to catch up, but know that I mean this post-procedure treatment um, as it's going to be termed then always occurs immediately after the procedure in the patient room. It doesn't matter whether it was done in the OR. It needs to be done immediately after the procedure there. We want to make sure that we're using our fresh cleaning solution. It may be detergent. It may be water. Um, some of the major manufacturers have validated water for pre-cleaning of flexible endoscopes. So you have to look at your IFU to know which ones are validated for pre-cleaning with water. And that's a, that's a big benefit in the OR when you don't have to bring in a container of detergent. So pre-cleaning is basically wiping the endoscope with a non-linting cloth or sponge soaked in your 
freshly prepared cleaning solution. Again, it may be detergent, it may be water, and you wipe from the control section to the distal tip. These wipes are single use, whether it's a cloth or a sponge, we need to make sure we're throwing that out after pre-cleaning and not reusing that for a later step of manual cleaning. Other things to make sure that's happening for pre-cleaning, making sure that the locks are unlocked or in the free position. We're suctioning that cleaning solution through the suction channel as per the manufacturer's written IFU and until it runs clear is what ST91 and the other guidelines say. So you may need to go longer if it's still uh, visibly soiled in your solution. Flushing all the channels on the scope per the IFU, whether they were used or not during the procedure, we need to do all of them every time. And then detaching it from the light source and suction pump. If you still have one of the models that have the older fluid resistant cap, you want to put it on then. And note if there's any damage to the scope visually, if you see any damage or if any damage was noted during the procedure, like maybe the image wasn't good. We want to make sure that we note that and then also, we have to note now, um, per the AORN guidelines and what's coming up in uh, the ST91 guidelines and is already in a statement from Olympus, is that you should be noting the time that, pre that the, um, the scope is withdrawn from the patient and when pre-cleaning is initiated, and then that must be conveyed to processing staff so that you know whether you're within that one hour hold time or not. And we're gonna talk about that shortly. So I just wanted to highlight at this step, there should be a way to document and then convey what time, when pre-cleaning was initiated, when the scope was withdrawn from the patient so you can make sure you're within that one hour. Contaminated transport of that scope from the, uh, from the patient room to processing is governed by OSHA regulations, which says that the transport container must have leak-proof sides and bottoms. It must be puncture resistant and labeled as biohazard. So as you see in some of the diagrams there, there are different ways to do it. Uh, this bottom one, not a good way to do it, right? Uh, it's not supported. It's not leak-proof or puncture resistant. If you are using a bag, it's recommended that that go into a solid container so that we have the leak-proof sides and bottoms into a container that's large enough to allow the endoscope to naturally coil in its large loops. There is some guidance related to retaining moisture for transportation, AORN is one of those guidelines that state that these endoscopes should be kept damp, moist, right, uh, in a humid environment for transportation. We don't want them submerged in liquid, in free liquid that could be sloshing around and spill. That's not a way to do it safely. Um, so either you need to put it in your transport container, you may use some kind of damp towel in there, or what we see commonly done are these humidity chamber bags where you add fluid into the wicking material inside the bag and you seal it up and that creates and maintains that humid environment for transport to the processing area to keep the soil on those scopes loose so that it can be more easily removed during the cleaning process. And that way it's not submerged completely. So that's something in the guidelines that, that a lot of facilities don't know. We need to maintain that humid environment. When we get to the processing area, the first thing we do is start with a leak testing. And I gave another program this morning um, where we talked solely about leak testing for almost an hour. So much information to know about this process. And I really do recommend that you look at every IFU for the different models of scopes that you process because you do see some differences in between uh, the types of models or manufacturers, but things to keep in mind, leak testing is always done in clean, clear water in a basin or sink large enough to allow that scope to naturally coil. If we have a sink that's too small, then we'll mask the holes and you won't have a good thorough leak test, allowing sufficient time. Most of the IFUs still say 30 seconds, although if you look, some of them have moved to 60 seconds. As an example, the new uh, duodenoscope that's out from Olympus, that one says 
30 seconds while you're manipulating the knobs uh, uh, that control the bending section, and then another 30 seconds while you're manipulating the elevator. So that's at least a minute that you're doing that. And we'll see longer periods of time in the new Amy ST91 document also. So keep that in mind. You'll also, per the Amy ST91 standard, you'd want to flush the, uh, the biopsy channel of the scope at minimum with a syringe full of water from your sink or basin flush that through that channel and that'll force out trapped air and that's to help you get a good thorough leak test um, and and not mistake the trapped air coming out of the scope for a leak or uh, you're not downplaying that it's not a leak because it's just trapped air so it really helps to make a thorough process there are recommendations to check your leak test unit to make sure that it's outputting the proper pressure because these machines, like uh, for example, here you see in the top picture, the Olympus MU1 and MB155, those, it can sound like they're running, but not be outputting the correct pressure. We use these for years and years and expect them to keep working when they can wear out over time. Currently, all we do is uh, on the connector of the MB155, and 155, it says you push the button and you, look, you listen for a sound, a hiss, and that tells you that it's working but it doesn't tell you whether it's the correct pressure or not. So you will see more information in the next ST91 about checking those or requirements for how frequently you should test them. So something you should investigate now, how you can check the pressure on your leak testers to make sure that they're outputting the correct PSI. Now we talked briefly about this before, but I do wanna call more attention to it. And that is that one hour hold time. And this is specific to Olympus scopes. Pentax and Fuji don't have a time delay listed in their IFUs or in supplemental measures. Um, but generally what we think is anything beyond 60 minutes is considered a delayed processing. And then what you have to do is an extended soak in detergent solution is required prior to starting the manual cleaning process. So we wanna avoid this as frequently as we can. We wanna make sure that scopes are processed within an hour um, because it can be problematic if, it, if that debris begins to dry and harden on the scope or in the channels. There are auxiliary channels on these scopes that are too tiny to get brushed. They're never brushed. And that can really lead to a buildup of bio burden over time. And uh, therefore we wanna avoid this and avoid any unnecessary long-term submersions, which can lead to repair issues because that humidity can build up on the inside of the scope. And that's why we need to track the time from pre-cleaning to manual cleaning and avoid it going beyond the one hour. You can do that with any kind of um, any kind of tag on the device. This is one that times for one hour, you push the button, starts a chemical reaction, and then the, um, an indicator fills up in the, in the little window on the label and shows you whether you're within an hour or not. Other facilities are putting a, a label on the transport container. It just means you have to figure out a way to document the, the patient withdrawal time pre-cleaning time, and then that has to be conveyed to processing staff. However you do that is up to your facility to determine. I also want to note this one hour hold time. It's not just between pre-cleaning and manual cleaning. It's also between manual cleaning and starting your high-level disinfection process in your AER. So it's one hour on either, on either side of manual cleaning per the Olympus instructions. And I have that here, um, a link to the customer statement from 2018. And also it's in all of the scope manuals. It's not in the cleaning process. It's usually further back in the manual under what's called the pre-soak for excessive bleeding and or delayed reprocessing. So that alludes to the fact that not only are you doing this after it's a more than a one hour time delay, but also if that scope was heavily soiled coming into the process. So if you had excessive bleeding or it was an emergency procedure and there was no prep done, then you would also want to follow this delayed reprocessing, which is an extended soak in detergent for up to one hour for our surgical scopes. So things like bronchoscopes or ureteroscopes and up to 10 hours for the GI scopes. And that helps to tell you why we want to avoid this because that lengthens the process so much and who has the extra sink space to give up to allow a scope to soak for that long. So we want to avoid this and by tracking it and timing it, 
That's how you do it. Here's the wording from AORN to support that. And it's also in that new, the Olympus statement here from 2018. It also says you should be um, documenting that time between pre-cleaning and manual cleaning and conveying that to processing staff. Let's move on to the next step in the process. That's manual cleaning. How can we engineer safety into manual cleaning? Here's some ways that we do that. We want to use all the recommended cleaning adapters. They come with the scope for a reason. I can't just shove them in a drawer. We need to make sure we know what each one is for and whether or not we should be using it. You need to flush all channels, rinse all channels, brush each channel that can be brushed per the IFU. Um, and then we look at it. If you see visible, visible debris on the scope, you want to repeat the whole process of manual cleaning. You also want to pay attention to any of our accessories and making sure they're getting the good quality steps that will engineer safety into the process. There are a lot of steps as far as making sure our reusable valves, for example, are processed properly. And I know a lot of facilities have moved to single use valves, but if you're still using the reusable ones, take a look at all the steps that are actually in the process of how to properly clean our valves. And at this point in the process for manual cleaning, where you may um, use an automated flushing pump. And if so, then you wanna keep in mind some key quality parameters and we'll talk about safety related to those. Next up on the list is brushes. What do you use? A good safety check for you is to make sure you're using a brush that's compatible with your endoscopes. How do you do that? Well, there's no um, guidance that says you have to use that brush that's uh, listed in the IFU from the endoscope manufacturer. Um, but if you're not using that brush, then you have to make sure it's of the appropriate size and compatible with the scope you're cleaning it. For. A lot of facilities use third-party brushes, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. It just becomes then a reality that you have to check and make sure you're using the appropriate sized cleaning brush that matches that channel. And these are some statements then from SGNA and AORN to support that. You just want to make sure that they're of the right length with material recommended by the endoscope manufacturers and make that appropriate size. So that's so important. If you are using automated flushing systems, you want to make sure you're following the validated parameters for that system, making sure that we're cleaning and disinfecting the tubing according to that manufacturer's IFU and that you're performing any quality testing like daily volume verification. They all have steps in their IFUs to do this, so make sure you're familiar with that. It's a great safety step to engineer in. The next safety step that we want to talk about is twofold. It is the cleaning verification and inspection, which are now already in each of the standards and guidelines as something you should be doing. So after the manual cleaning process, we do this twofold step of inspection with a lighted magnification for every scope and then a cleaning verification test at an interval decided upon by your facility. And we'll talk about what those intervals are in just a minute. All right, so as far as cleaning verification goes, what does your facility use? Protein tests, hemoglobin tests, combination test strips, an ATP system, other, none, or I don't know. Again, please feel free to, um, to answer this and make sure you scroll down if you don't see a submit button so that we can see what those answers are. And already, as I said, it is recommended in each of the standards that you do something for cleaning verification. One of these is appropriate, or, or any of these is appropriate for your facility. It's about what works best in your healthcare facility or system. Let's see where we're at. Okay, 14% using a protein, 9.5% using a, a test strip, 38% using ATP, 24% using none, and 14% I don't know. And that's okay. Thank you for your honesty. It is something you'll want to check on, though, because based on the standards, we all should be doing something for cleaning verification. Great. Let's move on. So we do have to do this inspection. As I said, minimum standard, minimum requirement is visual inspection with your unaided eye after every cleaning cycle. That's in the IFUs already to look for debris and damage. And if you see debris, it goes back through the full cleaning process. The guidelines go further to recommend a lighted magnification to look at your endoscopes. 
especially if you have if you have a duodenoscope, you need that lighted magnification to check around the forceps elevator. Then the guidelines go one step further and they consider using a boroscope is what they say. So not a, rec- a, not a requirement at this point, but just a recommendation, but something you want to consider implementing because that is the way that the guidelines are going. This is the verbiage from SGNA as far as cleaning verification goes. This is the interval that you want to pay attention from. So again, each of the guidelines says you should be doing something at a regular interval, and then that's where they differ. What's what's example of a regular interval? ST91 currently, the 2015 version says weekly, preferably daily. AORN says with each reprocessing cycle, and SGNA says at a frequency determined by your facility. So again, do something. We owe it to our patients. It's a clear safety step. Lots of methods out there for you to do it. Again, up to your facility to research and design a program that works best for your institution. We talked about the visual inspection step of endoscopes. This is your safety stop or timeout to ensure that the endoscope is visually clean and looks like it's in working order so it doesn't have any uh, cracks or corrosion or discoloration or retained debris and that would stop you from going on in the process. And again, if you see that debris, you reclean. These are the, this is the verbiage from AORN. If you're using AORN for your endoscope, you wanna add in that lighted magnification to identify soils. This is from APIC for our infection preventionist on inspecting duodenoscopes. Again, lighted magnification you see highlighted there. Boroscope usage, I have some pictures that I do want to get to to show you. Um, It is only a recommendation at this point. We'll have a lot more information in the ST91 new version when that is released to look inside the channels of the endoscope and make sure there's no debris, um, that there's no retained moisture. And that's what you see on the left-hand side here as far as the picture goes. This was a scope that had been hanging in a cabinet for seven days and it had not been dried before it went into the cabinet. So this was a patient-ready scope that I inspected with a boroscope, and it was completely wet in the internal channel. That's not acceptable for safety. We need to make sure these scopes are dry before they go into a cabinet. Then on the right-hand side, this was also a patient-ready scope. You clearly see lint stuck in the channel, and that's why the guidelines now require lint-free, or non-linting is the terminology that we prefer, non-linting cloth to dry the endoscopes or to wipe them down, and that's clearly a chunk of patient debris there. So scary. All things that we want to avoid when we're implementing safety. Some other pictures of lint. This is channel shavings, rust inside the the connect the, uh, valve housings. Look at that debris built up around the around the lens at the distal tip. And then we have on the right-hand side, we have a drop of fluid and bio burden, some kind of debris in there. All of this is uh, visibly can be seen when you're using a boroscope. There is an Olympus communication that was put out in 2019 about using a boroscopes and what brand new channels look like. So you can compare those images to what you're seeing so that you have a reference as to what a good channel looks like versus what you're seeing now to help you determine whether that should go out for repair. This is um, a good resource that I want to share with you from Corey Ofsted and her uh, her group, Ofsted and Associates. They have a, a great lineup of webinars that you can go and, and take for education and for credits on a d- variety of topics, including visual inspection, amongst others, external and internal inspection. And they're a great resource for when you're implementing a boroscope procedure or process in your facility to know what to look for, what's appropriate, and what's not. All right. Hey, we got 15 minutes yet. We're doing okay. I want to make sure we get through everything. As far as drying and alcohol flush, uh, such an important part of the process that we never knew before. The key takeaways for you are we need to dry the endoscope after it comes out of the AER externally and internally. So we need to wipe that with a non-linting cloth um, prior to storage, but we also need to flush the internal channels with a cycle of compressed air. And how do we do that? There's a variety of ways you can do that. You can either use one of the drying pumps that connect directly to the channels or your engineering, your biomeds may have a setup that you have piped in air that you um, have connectors to go to the channels 
or the scope may go into an active drying cabinet that hooks up to the channel. Any is appropriate, but what is the key takeaway for safety here is you need to be actively drying your scopes after they come out of the AER. What's in the AER is not really a drying cycle, it's an air purge and none of them are validated drying cycles. So we need to make sure that we're following all of those AER cycles up with this forced air. What quality should it be? Instrument air is what we want um, as far as fl uh, flushing with compressed air. Now, some of your pumps and your cabinets are HEPA filtered air. That's your minimum standard of quality, but preferred would be this instrument quality air. And here's the definition of what that is in case you wanna tell that to your facilities department. The latest research and guidelines do show 10 minutes is what it takes of flushing each channel hooked up to it continually to dry <clears throat> to dry those channels. So you can see why it would be challenging to stand there with an air gun and blow each channel out for 10 minutes. And that why that's why we see that process being discouraged is because it is so difficult. You can't just blow into your air water channel uh, connector and expect it to go through there properly. You would need a connector on that. So it's challenging and that's why we see most facilities moving to a drying pump or a drying cabinet. But really, if you can figure out a way to get it set, that's fine. Um, SGNA has taken a hard stance on this. They say if an endoscope is not dry before it went into the storage cabinet, then it should not be used. It would need to be reprocessed again before use. So think about those implications. If you don't know that your cycle is verified as resulting in a dry scope, so you're doing 10 minutes of drying and you've not verified that, then how can you be in compliance with the SGNA, SGNA guidelines? You have to verify that process. How do you do that? Well, you have a couple options nowadays. You can either inspect some of your scopes in your cabinet with a boroscope and see, do you see water droplets inside those channels? If you don't, you know your drying practices are adequate. If you do, then you know you have to lengthen that drying parameter. Um, or you can use a drying test. There's a couple of these on the market now. We either have things like the scope dry check, which is a business card size. One side has the directions. The other side has this purple ink on it that when it detects water or moisture, it will turn bright white spots. So um, what's done in facilities, they'll take this card while blowing their air through the scopes after their 10 minutes is completed. They'll put the card at the different outlets of the scope and see if it detects any moisture. There are also swab-based products available now that you run the swab through the channel and that gets cut off into a vial with a powdered reagent in it. And if it detects any moisture, it turns bright purple also within the on the swab or in the powder itself. Then you know your scope is not dry and you need to lengthen your drying cycle. So it's so important to make sure we're drying those scopes before they go into storage. Wearing clean gloves is common, uh, common thread in all the standards and guidelines now. So anytime you're handling a processed endoscope, you should have clean gloves on. And if you're still using the reusable valves, they should be kept together or be traceable back to the procedure and the scope that was used. So kept together as a unique set. We do see less and less that being used. Drying cabinets based on AORN is the preferred method. So at minimum, you want HEPA filtered air circulating within the cabinet, but it is preferred um, by some of the standards that that HEPA filtered air or instrument air is, collect, is connected directly to the channels and blown through it for a cycle that results in a dry scope. And that's up to your scope, uh, scope cabinet manufacturer to tell you what that cycle is. Some are vertical when, the, when they're active drying cabinets, some are horizontal. Because drying doesn't rely on gravity like we used to think it did, um, if you're in a drying cabinet with air hooked up directly to the channels, then SGNA and even the scope manufacturers say that that is okay. How long can you hang a scope before it has to be processed again? Um, well, we have some information in ST91 and AORN that you should perform a risk assessment to make sure that you're setting a policy for a maximum storage interval that is safe in your facility. SGNA says seven days if you're doing everything right for processing and it's completely dried before it goes in there and it's uh, kept in a manner to prevent recontamination. So if you're not checking your drying practices, then I will contend that you wouldn't even get seven days. So you need to make sure your scopes are dry in order to do that. 
How do you uh, label your scopes? Well, we need to have a distinct visual cue on our endoscopes, and we see that in the next slide here. The guidelines say they should have some kind of cue on them that allows anybody looking in that scope cabinet to show or to see that it was reprocessed and is ready for patient use. However you do that is up to you. It can be as simple as a tag or a label affixed to the scope, but it has to be something that I could walk into your cabinet and see. Again, how you decide to do that is up to your internal policies, but please make sure that they are labeled appropriately. We need to keep in mind some sterilization options for endoscope. And if you have a scope that's already compatible with sterilization, then it should be sterilized based on the Spalding classification for these semi-critical devices, that's endoscopes, if that they should be sterilized. And then if that's not possible, we resort to disinfection. So please take a look at your scope mix and the IFUs and separate customer letters from your scope manufacturers to see maybe some of your scopes, like your bronchoscopes, for example, are already compatible with many low temperature systems or the, your ureteroscopes. Those now require sterilization based on updated IFUs. So a great safety step that you can take is looking at your scope mix and determining can this already be sterilized? I'll challenge you to look at your bronchoscopes. If you're disinfecting them, get those moved to sterilization. We owe that safety step to our patients. I have here an action plan. Take an inventory of your scopes, see what you have. What are they already compatible? Move scopes that can be sterilized over to sterilization based on that compatibility. Look at your scope inventory that remains that can't be sterilized. Prioritize, the, prioritize those based on risk. Based on FDA recommendations, you should be doing something more with your duodenoscopes, like sterilizing them or culturing them if you can't sterilize them or using a liquid chemical sterilization cycle. You may also need to adjust your inventory levels of scopes as you move toward sterilization. This slide is another critical safety step that I want you to think about. These were the original safety measures that came out as supplemental actions to enhance the duodenoscope processing steps back in 2015. Originally, it said you should do more with your scopes for risk mitigation for the duodenoscopes particularly, such as culturing them. Performing sterilization at the time, ethylene oxide was the only sterilization method of available for those. There's more now out there using a liquid chemical processing system or repeat high-level disinfection. But what you see in those new safety alert that's come out from last year that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, double disinfection is no longer listed as an option in there. And why is that? That's because we've had several studies that have come out that have shown that it doesn't matter whether you're disinfecting a scope once or twice. There's no statistically significant difference in the culture positivity rate for those endoscopes, whether it's one time through the process or two. And I think, I think that's a critical safety step. If you're doing just double disinfection on your duodenoscopes, I will urge you to do more because there is a lot of evidence out there now that it doesn't make any impact. If you are looking to move to culturing of your scopes, here's some information. I'm talking about testing your scopes for bacteria content. We're not talking about cleaning verification tests like ATP. I'm talking about a full culture after disinfection. You remove that scope from storage and you test it to see what the bacterial contamination levels are. And there's no requirement that, to do this at this point. It is just a recommendation uh, for your duodenoscopes, but I believe it's a critical safety step in demonstrating that your processes for duodenoscopes are under control. If you do want to culture your scopes, here's what I recommend. You go to the FDA CDC ASM culture method from 2018. It is a validated method superseding the previous CDC method, and it is much more robust than the previous method. It's a flush brush flush with sterile water. It adds a neutralizer into that water sample that's taken and a longer incubation time. So we do see much better results using this new method.
There are also gram-negative rapid test kits that are on the market as opposed to full culturing. These take about a 12-hour turnaround time, and they look specifically for gram-negative bacteria such as Pseudomonas or E. coli. They're covered in ST91 under types of verification testing, which are enzyme-based tests, and there is some peer-reviewed literature out there around these uh, demonstrating that it is effective at detecting gram-negative organisms in processed endoscopes. So with that, we are down to the wire and it did make it, but I will urge you, please take these safety steps to engineer quality into your endoscope processing procedures. It will make it much more robust and much safer for our patients with these steps that we talked about. I've given you the evidence-based guidelines and the national standards and professional society guidelines to back up each of those recommendations or requirements. And these are really simple quality control steps that you can engineer in to make a high quality process every time for our patients. The standards, I'm sorry, the references were noted on the slides and also here, of course, the AMI standards, SGNA, AORN, all of those. I thank you so much for your attention today. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and we can get those answered for you. We do have a few minutes, Lindsay, for questions. If you want to run one or two by me, and if not, Absolutely. I'll address all of those offline then. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah, Marianne, thank you so much for that presentation, for all the critical information that you provided for our thank attendees you. today. Uh, I am going to squeeze in as many questions as okay. we can. Fire. Let's do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, first question. I usually see that when people process scopes, the soak time is often shortened or skipped. How critical do you see this step, and would a scope buddy device substitute for this step? Great question, and the answer to that is no. <laughs> uh, we need to follow the detergent label, the manufacturer's label for how long to soak it. So you do all of your steps for flushing, then you should let it sit, and that's the way the scope IF user laid out, let it sit for that contact time. It may be one or two minutes. I know it adds time on the process, but you need to give time for those detergents to work. The same thing if you're using something like a flushing pump, scope buddy, whatever it may be, you do your steps, let it sit. That time, I, I urge you, if you are doing that, say you need that in writing from your manufacturer because it's really about doing those steps, letting it sit for the contact time. Great question. Okay, this question, my facility's women's health clinic wants our SPD to reprocess their flexible his hysteroscopes. Mm -hmm. We have major concerns about being able to do that within the appropriate time frame. Mm -hmm. So we have been suggesting uh, disposable products for them. So far, we've only found one disposable flexor flexible hysteroscope on the market. Do you think there will be more options in the future? I do think there'll be more options. We have several different types of single-use endoscopes available already. I have not heard much about hysteroscopes. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure about what's coming on the market, but I can only assume that as part of the market transitions to single-use scopes, that we'll see more of those become available. For now, you do have to pay attention to that one-hour time delay, and if it goes beyond that hour, you would have to do the extended soak, which is challenging and you want to make sure that we're not doing that more frequently than we need to. So that is a challenge, but keep an eye out for new models of scopes coming on the market. Okay, last question that we have time for. We have so many guidelines from different agencies for flexible yep. endoscopes. Who has the most important guidance? <laughs> uh, well, I can't say that. Who has the most important guide guidance? You have to decide what's right for your facility. Uh, I'm partial to ST91, of course, because I co-chair that committee. Uh, but mainly because it is a national ex uh, standard, and we do have a multifunctional working group that consists of of many user facilities. So technicians at your level in the healthcare facility sit on our committee and give us guidance. We have scope manufacturers, AER manufacturers, representatives from SGNA, APIC, AORN, the GI physicians associations, they all sit on ST91 and give their feedback to it. So of course I'm partial to that one. And because it covers all scopes, no matter what the type, in any healthcare setting. So it's really what's right for your facility. Okay, Marianne, thank you so thank much. Thank you, for everybody.
Yeah, for this important discussion on engineering quality and, and into endoscope processing by outlining best practices, current standards and guidelines, such critical information. If we didn't get to your question, I will certainly send those over to Mary Ann so that she can address those via email. Uh, if you have any additional questions that come up, you see her contact information on the screen. You can also find find it at any time logging back into this session in the future and accessing the contact info in the speaker bio box on the right hand side of your screen. You do have about 15 minutes before the next presentation. Again, thank you so much for this information, Marianne, and thank we'll you. see you in the next session. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you.